Hello, uh, good morning and good afternoon, everyone. Happy Friday. My name is Jamie Lee. I'm the Director of Marketing at Accelerate, and I'll be moderating today's session. Um, our second boot camp, Six Secrets to Sales Management with speakers Josh Friend and Gail Vermillion, who will be introducing themselves and sharing a little bit about their background and experience, and then powering through six tips over the next 30 minutes or so. Um, if you have any questions at any point during the presentation, feel free to drop them into the Q&A box and we will get to them at the end. We've got about 10 to 15 minutes designated to answering your questions. Um, if you're interested in our upcoming boot camps, we have one every Friday for the remainder of the month. Please um, learn more on our website, accelerate.com slash blog. Uh, and lastly, yes, this is being recorded and everyone will be getting a copy about an hour after the close of the session. So without further ado, I'm going to go ahead and pass things off to Josh. Good morning, everybody, or afternoon, I guess, depending on what coast you're on. Uh, here in California, it's, it's the morning. I'm excited to be here again today. Uh, last week, I, some of you guys might have been part of the call. Uh, I think it was uh, some great information. Um, I'm excited to be here. I'm excited to be working with Dale. Uh, some of you guys know Del Vermillion. He's been in the mortgage industry for about 35 years. Has really set the uh, tone for sales coaching, sales training. Uh, I've had the experience of having worked with some of my mortgage companies in the past, so I know what uh, great information he has. So we're excited to have him part of this. And then I'm excited to be here because, you know, I've made my career uh, in the industry for 20 years. I started off as a loan officer and started mortgage companies, and I've trained thousands of loan officers personally and it's really great to be able to share some of the tips that I've had through the years and some of the success and uh, some of the learnings I've had. And then obviously, I think I'm going to learn from Dale. So I'll let Dale introduce himself and then we'll get into uh, kind of how we can help you and you know, give you some tips of how to improve your production in this marketplace. Hey, Josh, really great to be back with you. Thank you again for the opportunity. And, and yes, as you mentioned, uh, I've been 35 years in the business, the last 23 as a speaker. Uh, trainer and consultant, and have had the great privilege to to uh, train uh, almost 500 lenders around the country over that course of time, and, and um, uh, nearest we can estimate, close to a million um, loan officers and, and and lots of leaders. And and I'm excited about talking about leadership today because I think sales management is such a key piece of the puzzle. Um, I think executive leadership is a key piece. We're going to talk about all of those elements. And, um, and really talk about how to use practical techniques to uh, really impact your organization in today's competitive marketplace and, and, and get the most out of your sales force. So I'm excited to be here, appreciate the opportunity, and, uh, and excited to work with uh, the audience. Awesome. Great. You know, Dell, you said uh, that the practical side of selling, which is, is, is exciting for us. I think, you know, there's a couple parts of selling. Uh, there's the art of selling. And then there's the process of selling, right? So some people's art is how do you sound on the phone? What do you say? How do you build a rapport? And a lot of people are really great at that. But then the process of selling is sometimes some things lenders and individuals could use help with. Um, one of the things that we have found very helpful is how do you set up alerts and process flows that really allow you to make sure you're working on the most uh, important and efficient things. You know, something I've said for years is, being busy and being productive are not the same thing. A lot of busy people that aren't productive. There's a lot of productive people that sometimes aren't as busy as, as other folks. And that really comes down to the process of knowing where you should be spending your time um, and who you should be talking to and what processes you should be going after. You know, if we ask ourselves this question, uh, you know, out in the audience, if you're in front of me, I'd say, can, who here can remember the last 20 people they spoke to? And I mean, I have a good memory. I don't remember the last 20 people I spoke to. If you're a loan officer, you don't remember the last 20 people you spoke to. And if you're a company, your loan officers don't remember the last 20 people they spoke to or 30 or 40 or who they spoke to two months ago. But yet all those people are valuable prospects and being able to know who to talk to, when to talk to them becomes extremely uh, impactful. Uh, we have seen things where you can set up alerts. I'll give you what I mean by an alert. About 80% of borrowers' transactions typically are the same way. Uh, the communication cadence, how often they want to be communicated with, what the best strategies are to communicate with them, the topics they want to cover, even if you think about it, uh, the process of closing the loan. About 80% of them go down what we call the happy path. They don't need appraisal or repairs. There's not some major issue on title. Uh, their income is pretty straightforward. 
Uh, you can get the asset statements you need. There's no exceptions that have to be made. To understand how the average customer transacts becomes really powerful and really impactful. So what you can do is figure out some of the major sales gates and set alerts up around those major sales gates to make sure you're driving the behaviors you want. Uh, an alert would be, example, a sales gate that we have found that is extremely impactful is disclosures being sent. Um, I know we've discussed this in other webinars in the past, but we've taken a look at our database and our lenders and transactions. We took a look at 8,000 funded transactions, and we looked at the borrower behavior and the communication strategy and the work strategy that went along with those 8,000 funded transactions. And what we found, on average, lenders get back when they send out disclosures. On average, the average lender gets back 36% of disclosures, come back in, and go into processing. However, when lenders called those disclosures sent three times in 24 hours, not two times, it was definitely it was three times, that number went from 36% to 79%. That's a huge uptick. So all you out there listening to this, I'd write that down and remind yourself that calling your disclosure sent is the most valuable thing in your process right now. If anyone you're talking to, so when you disclose, you've approved for a loan, you've gave them something they can qualify for, that's your most valuable um, time to, that, that where you should spend your time. So how do you manage that? Well, use a system that can accelerate. Um, you know, some people use you know, a manual process, which is very difficult to use, but have a system that can set up and say, disclosure's been sent in real time. You know what's going on. Make your first call, right? Get your second call, get your third call. Talk to the customer. You know, years ago, uh, I was starting a call center for American Center in the Bank. And so when I first brought my team over, the first three or four months, I got on the phone, and I was selling and training and teaching. I remember a client, and I still remember her name, was Susan Anderson. I'll never forget this one because I called her. She was going to do a loan. She decided not to do a loan. I called her 26 times after she said no to me. However, I didn't really call her on the right time in a communication strategy. We knew that you call it three weeks, six weeks, nine weeks, and there's a pattern to it that was most effective. So I just called and called and called. Lo and behold, our system took that lead after I stopped calling, and when the appropriate follow-up time was given, served it up to another loan officer. Sure enough, Gary Botto, still a really good friend of mine, got that call, got that lead, called Susan Anderson on call number 27, turned it into a deal, and he funded that transaction. And it was just a really big eye-opener that said, you know what? I knew the best communication strategy, but yet I didn't quite follow it the way I should. So now let's get really detailed and let's really follow this communication strategy. And all of us know that. We all have customers that we've missed because they raised their hand and we didn't follow them on the, on the time frame that was most important to them. So remember, being busy and being productive are two different things. And you really should focus in on what's the most valuable thing you need to be doing right now to get you the business and have a system that can alert to you each day Here's who I need to call. Here's the appraisal I need to order. Whatever the tasks are to actually help you drive behavior. And if you're a loan officer, you should be doing this for yourself. If you're running a team, you should have a process put in place. This isn't rocket science. If you take a look at your top producers, they're going to have a very similar contact strategy, and they follow that strategy. So build a system so it's easy for every loan officer to manage to. They don't have to figure out who to call and when to call. So again, really... Focus it on what's most important and be, be productive. Your goal is to be productive and it's not, not just to be busy. Dale, any, any thoughts? Well, um, what you talked about and having alerts is really important. And, and uh, Jamie, if you go to the next slide, I, I want to use a quote that I think is, is really ties into what you talked about that simply says this, you got to inspect what you expect. Let me say that again. You got to inspect what you expect. Um, let, let me tell you a quick story that, that I always love to use when we talk about, I talk about leadership and sales management. Uh, there's these two guys that go hunting uh, up to northern Minnesota every year to this uh, little hunt club, and they've got this great dog up there, and he's the reason we go, whose name is Salesman. Salesman's amazing. He's not only a, a great bird dog, but when, uh, when somebody knocks down the bird, he, he retrieves the bird, he points the bird, he, he brings back the bird, he cooks the bird. This is like the ultimate hunting dog. Well, for 10 years in a row, these guys go, they come for their 11th year trip. And when they get there, the owner says, you know what, guys, I hate to tell you this, but you got to pick a different dog. And of course, their response is, oh, my gosh. Wait, no, why? What happened? Did he die? And they're like, no, he didn't die. He's over there in the kennel. He just can't take him. 
And they said, well, wait a minute. What do you mean we can't take him? This is the reason we come. He, salesman is the best hunting dog on the planet. And with that, the owner looks at him and says, well, you know what? What happened yesterday was somebody took him out hunting and accidentally called him sales manager. And all he does is sit on his butt and bark. <laughs> now, you, you may or may not be able to relate to that. I'm certain that every one of us have had a manager that they sat on their butt and barked and did not get up and really get involved in the process. And the reason I tell that story is because having these alerts is powerful, but managing to that process just makes it so much more powerful because we know every day that in managing salespeople that, you know, you can give directive by technology, but if you also support that with the personal leadership style that keeps in contact with your people, you've got a double win going on. I love the stuff that Accelerate is doing in creating opportunities for the loan officers and the managers to know what's happening within the files, within the process, and that is critical. But as managers, if all we do all day long is sit and look at reports, and I will tell you honestly, as I travel the country, I see this where because of technology and all of the emails in particular that we get and, and looking at pipeline reports and looking at all the things we do, we tend to get bogged down so much and not take all of this good information and utilize it for two things. Number one, accountability by making sure that we're going out to our teams, talking to them about what we're seeing, making sure that we're, we're creating actions behind those alerts so that when that alert comes, we can make sure that we get up out of our desk, we go to our salespeople, we have conversations in the middle of the sales floor as to what that is happening because what happens here is two things. Not only do you create an accountability measure if they know you're coming, I've always said, and if, if I'm a manager, I want you to write this down, that presence drives performance. And I believe that's very true. The more that we are out among our people, the more we're going to be able to really utilize these kind of powerful tools and techniques to have an impact. If we're out there and we're creating that accountability, what we're also able to do at the same time is spend time in seeing what's going on on our sales floor and training to some of these things and motivating to some of these things, which I'll talk about more in detail in just a little bit. So having access and, and, and I love, Josh, how, how you talked about a moment ago that, you know, being busy does not mean that you're being effective. Uh, I agree with that wholeheartedly. I, I see a lot of busyness out there in the marketplace, in the mortgage arena, where I see loan officers doing a lot of activities, but I don't see the sales happening. And without the sales, it doesn't really matter what we're doing because sales is what drives everything. So we need to make sure they're doing the right activities. We need to make sure that they're following up properly on these alerts. We need to make sure that they're doing the things that are necessary. And in order to do that, it can't be done by a chain of emails. Number one, that's the most ineffective way to do it. Number two, you're not having that personal conversation time that allows you to really get involved, get impacted and give good direction. And therefore, you're not having the right interaction with your people. So establish that accountability behind these alerts so that what happens is you've got the, the, the dynamic duo working for you. So you've got both sides of the equation working. Any thoughts on that, Josh? Yeah, no, I think that's great. I, I really liked what you said. Presence drives performance. Um, something that I've learned through the years and told managers, listen, you can't drive your desk, right? If you're sitting behind your desk, if you're not on the sales floor, you're not being as uh, productive with your team as possible. And, and I, I like the, I really like that presence strategy performance. I wrote that one down, Dale. That's a, that's a good one to really think about, which is manage people at their desk is what I've also said. If you're in a call center or even if it's your retail shop, if you have people that work at a desk, it's better to go to where they're working and in their environment so that presence is known. And as you said, you... Uh, inspect what you expect. What I've found through the years, if you have a normal um, cadence to how you manage sales, and if you do a follow-up with your team, they're not going to, if you ask them the consistent questions on a daily, weekly basis, they're not going to want to continue to say, no, I didn't do that. Oh, no, it's not done yet. They're either going to figure out how to lie to you, right, or they're going to start getting it done. And it drives the behaviors and performance. And really, at the end of the day, the question is, how do you measure and manage that? Um, and what does that look like? So there's a lot of different things to look at. What we like to do is we call it measure effort and effectiveness. 
You know, on our platform, we give a really great tool that allows you to measure effort and effectiveness. You know, in sales, the job is very simple. We make money by talking to somebody, right? We make money communicating. So the question is, first is, if someone's not being as productive as you'd like them to be, do they, A, do they want to do the job? Step number one, if someone's not being successful, is that you need to ask yourself the question, does that loan officer want to do this job? Are they willing to do this job? Second question is, do they have the skills to do the job? So having the ability to manage the effort and effectiveness, the effort meaning if this is a telephone sales job, well, how often are you on this phone? How many times have you called somebody? How many minutes have you been on the phone? How many hours today, this week, have you been on the phone? How many attempts have you made on your leads to call somebody? How, how much effort is being put into the sales job? And then next to it, you want to know how effective is somebody being? All right, so how many times have you started a loan in the LOS? How many times have you pulled credit? How many disclosures have you sent? How many loans have you priced? How many loans have you sent to processing? So that's the effectiveness. So you want to understand the two different things. Is how much effort is someone put into the job and how effective they are being put into the job. Step one, if they're not, being, they're not getting the results you want, you can simply look at it and say, well, the effort's not there. I know I need to focus in on it. Now, if the effort's there and they're putting in the effort but they're not being very effective, then you go, okay, I need to then manage to the sales process. They're not being as efficient as possible. They're willing to do the job. How can I help them? And we're going to talk about uh, how to listen to calls and, uh, and you know, really manage that. But those are the things that you want to be looking at. And the last thing I really want to talk about as far as effort and effectiveness is you're a loan officer or sales manager or you're running a company, understand your numbers. Right? What I mean by that is this. <clears throat> right now, every loan officer out there has numbers that work for them when they get to production. What I mean by that is they have a certain percentage of loans that they leads they take and what percentage goes into LOS. Loans that go into leads that go into LOS, a certain percentage that go to the uh, credit being pulled. Credit being pulled, a certain percentage go to the disclosure sent, disclosures back, and a fund ratio. So understand your numbers all along the way. You know, on average, your company has an average. So if you start having averages and you start understanding the sales gates, then you can compare your loan officers to each one of those milestones and figure out why someone's not getting productive. You know, I, I know an example. I had a loan officer years ago that their, our, our company average was 49% of all uh, leads turn into an application, 36% turn into disclosure. We went through this, we were very much in the average numbers. However, this person, it was 80% of every application was a disclosure being sent. And 85% of every disclosure sent came back in. I was like, wow, I mean, what a great conversion, much higher than the rest of the company. However, credits pulled. She only pulled 10% of credit. So she was only pulling one in 10, and the rest of the company was pulling five in 10. So as, as effective as the conversion was in the back end of getting those disclosures back, getting the process back, she wasn't being effective taking the applications and she wasn't working the application. So for someone like that, well, how do I increase productivity? It's really simple. Let's train you on how to get more applications. Hey, if we can get you from 10% credit pool to 20% credit pool, what's going to happen to your production? So you then you can start honing in. Now you need the tools to see the report and so you know where these, where these gaps are and where you can really take up production. I remember we worked with her, she got up to a 20% credit pool and she basically doubled the production. And so it's understanding where those numbers are and you need to be able to have a system that you can actually really manage to it and you can see that. So really understand your numbers, understand you know, the effort and the effectiveness of what your sales force is uh, being done. And again, Dale, I really like performance drives, uh, uh, presence drives performance. I'm glad to hear that. I appreciate that. Um, so, if you'll go to the next slide again, Jamie. I want to. I want to really um, complement what Josh is talking about here. And I think the thing that that I like about this series is that you know Josh is the technology expert, um, and and what I'm trying to bring to this is the we'll call it the softer side of the sale, the the daily management side of that. So as he was talking about, you know, making sure that that he is providing this effort and effectiveness, these two E's, I'm going to add two more E's to that, and that is encourage and energize. Again, I said that presence drives performance, but I want you to also understand that presence drives even a lot more than that. 
And, and, and let me give you an example of this. So when I come into a new client's office, and, and this happens often where a client will hire me, bring me in to do an initial orientation, to meet with the management team, to kind of see the sales team on the floor. One of the common things that I will do uh, when I first get there is I will go to the management team and say, look, before we even discuss anything, just give me five minutes to walk the sales floor and I want to give you a few observations. And when I walk that sales floor, what I will do is uh, I will come back to the management team and say, let me just tell you who your top producers are, your mid producers are, and your low producers are. And almost every time I'm at about a 90% accuracy rating without ever really having spent any time and just watching and scanning the salespeople. Now, now this is more in call center environments and I work with a lot of retail groups too, where you know you you can see this with people in out on the uh, on the streets when they're working with realtors and that kind of thing. But here's what I'm looking at. I'm looking at energy. That sounds strange, but you you can see an awful lot about the effectiveness of a loan officer based on how enthusiastic they are, their body posture, the look on their face, the way they're interacting, the tone of their voice. The, the activities that are happening, there, there's a lot you can read out of salespeople and there's a lot that you can improve in their results if you're watching for these things and managing for those. Managers ask me this question all the time. If you were to define one key to success for management, what would that key be? And I say, that's simple. It's one word. The word is replicate. Your job as a manager is to replicate or create replication. What does that mean? In other words, replicate yourself. I want you to make 20 of you because if you're the manager, what that tells me is you obviously were very good as a salesperson because you got promoted the sales manager. Therefore, I'm assuming that you want 20 people that were just like you when you were a loan officer, because if you had that, you wouldn't have any problems anymore. You'd have highly motivated people that are highly enthusiastic, that are doing a good job, that are staying after it, that are effective, just like Josh talked about. So in order to replicate, two things have to happen. Number one is you gotta make sure you train. Number two is you gotta make sure you motivate. And motivations to me, absolutely critical. Where does motivation come from? It comes from encouragement. Believe it or not, it's that simple. If you encourage salespeople on a daily basis, if you're constantly focusing on finding the things they're doing well and making sure you tell them they're doing it well, promote that within your teams, repeat that within your teams, then you replicate best behaviors, best practices, and best performances. When you find things that are done wrong, you coach through those things, but still from an encouraging mindset. So if you really want to build a powerful sales force, one of the keys is you got to encourage and energize them to be successful. You got to get their energy level to a higher level. You got to get their motivation to a higher level because Highly energetic people, highly motivated people are just better salespeople at the end of the day, no questions asked. We've all seen it. We've seen people with average sales ability, but really good sales results because they're just, they're magnets. They're, they're excited that you, that you can't slow them down. They stay on the phones, they stay after it. The more energy they have, the more they stay on the calls. You want to make that happen. So ways to do that, make sure that you've got a good positive environment. Have some music in the background. That's a good thing to have to create a little bit of energy. If you've got a dim lidded or dim lights in the office, well, brighten up your office. Paint the walls white if you need to. Get some bright colors in there. Put some lights in and have motivating messages around and make sure that you've got lots of that electricity happening. That happens by walking the floor, encouraging people, and making sure that you're energized and daily. And get them to stand up. One of the things that I think is critical to the success of a, a top flight salesperson is they're usually not sitting in their chair all day long. They're up and moving around. It's it just all the things that you do to create energy, to create encouragement, to create positivity, just help drive all of these things that we're talking about to a new level. Because now you're not just having them do the right behaviors, but you're having them do the right behaviors with the right mindset, with the right motivations and with the right enthusiasm. And these things will lead to great results. Yeah, you know, I think that's, uh, I think that's right on point there. Um, the energy, you know, I think what you're, the point you're making of you're a coach, not necessarily just a manager. How do you coach and energize yourselves for, you know, all the years 
when I used to interview loan officers, I would sit down, especially if there was someone that had not been in the industry or that had some experience, small experience in the industry, I would, I would make a statement. I would say, you know, in this job that you're going to have as a loan officer, the biggest challenge is not going to be, and I want you all to hear this, Right, because even in a down market, there's people making a bunch of money. And we're going into a market where rates are going up, so it will be a little more work than it had been in the past. However, I'm in this impression, what I've seen through 20 years, is those loan officers, as Dale said, that have the energy and the mental fortitude to push through it are the ones that, 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 that thrive and grow. Which is, your biggest challenge, it's not going to be how low are the rates, or how fast is process and turn time, or how good are my leads or what's underwriters' conditions, or what are the programs, your biggest challenge to success is going to be just that, the mental mindset of how you do your job. And to Dell, your point, energy. You know, something that, you know, as you're talking about standing up, I'm standing up as I'm talking right now because that's how I like to talk because it does give me energy. And I know, and we all know, that energy conveys passion and people like to follow that. So, you know, I'll, I'll get into how to do some sales call reviews, but something, that, you know, to your point, Dell, because that really resonated, which is, Listen, if you want good energy, something you need to think about. Um, you look at professional athletes, right? You look at, you know, people that are playing the NBA, the NFL, and these people train, right? I mean, they're training, they have diet, they get sleep. I mean, they work so hard because they're physical athletes. They make a living based off their physicality, how high they can jump, how fast they can run, how strong they are. All of us, <coughs> we make our living, we're mental athletes. It's no different. We make our living by how our brains work and the physiology of our body and our energy we have. So we should take that mindset. So, you know, the questions are, are you getting a good enough sleep? Are you, what's your diet look like? Is it good? Are you feeding yourself what's going to help you? Are you exercising? Because exercise definitely helps the mind. It gives you energy. And then are you feeding your mind with good things? Are you learning? Are you reading? Are you, you're on the webinar like something like today. Are you doing things that can expand your mind? All those things really help you with um, uh, energy. And like a mental athlete and like a physical athlete, get into sales calls and reviewing and sales coaching, something to really think about, we're all on the phone. We're professionals. It's our job to sell. It's our job to explain benefit and present to somebody. Just like uh, Kobe Bryant, something, you know, I'm a Lakers fan. grew up in uh, Southern California my entire life. So, of course, you know, the Lakers show, is always, the Lake shows, we call, has always been big here. Kobe Bryant, all, you know, who – We'll debate who's the best uh, basketball player of all time because there's a handful of them that we could, we could go in, but definitely most people would throw Kobe Bryant in the top five. Right? One of the things that they, you read about Kobe Bryant was he was meticulous at watching video. So much so, he would review so much game film that Phil Jackson at one point came and said, hey, Kobe, I know you're up there watching game film when you're traveling, and you're, I know you're watching game film, game film in between all the games and flights but could you come out of your room a little more often and can you spend some time with our younger players? Because we'd like you to, you know, let them, let, like it to rub off on them. But here's a guy who was at the top of his game and he spent, he watched his own game film over and over again. And he took notes. When I came down the right side of the court, he went left, I went right. All the different process, how he did his job, he was an expert at it. If the job that we have is to sell, and we want to know what it sounds like when we're selling to the customer, we should be doing the exact same thing. Whether you're the loan officer or the manager, you need to listen to sales calls, right? Listen to what does it sound like? Is there energy on the phone? What does that first 30 seconds of the call sound like? What does the end of the call sound like? So to be effective in listening to sales calls, first you need a system that allows you to easily get into sales calls. And then write a sales call checklist. You should have a checklist that tells you what are the three or four things that you really want them, you want it with energy level up? Do they ask for the business, right? Did they present benefit? What are the things that you want to make sure you manage to and get really good at it? You know, this again, you know, an example I use with sales presentations, uh, I'm sure out here on the phone at this point, everyone here is, not everyone, but most people have seen Kirby vacuum salesmen. So Kirby vacuums are I mean, somewhere between two or $3,000 for a vacuum. And they sell vacuums door to door. And you ask yourself, how does someone sell a vacuum that's somewhere in the two to $3,000 range where you can go down and buy a, you know, a vacuum at Target for 100 bucks, or you can get like a Dyson, which everyone thinks is the coolest vacuum for maybe 200 bucks? How do you sell a $2,000 vacuum? And the answer to that is sales presentation. It's a very crafted presentation 
They're experts at what they do, and they review it. They practice it. They do a sales presentation while someone watches so they can fine-tune their sales presentation. There's no difference than what we are doing. When you're on the phone with someone, you are presented. How does that sound? That's your job. You can review that. You can watch that. You know, listen to what your loan officer is saying. Are they presenting the benefit? Are they asking for the business? Do they have high energy? We discussed the effort and effectiveness. And this is where really managing to the um, effectiveness comes in. When you have a loan officer that's putting in the effort, but they're not being very effective, a lot of times it comes into the sales call. What are they saying on the phone? Are they presenting benefit? Do they have energy? Right? Are they asking the right questions? Are they driving a benefit to the customer? Again, really understand and listen to sales calls. You really think about it. We are, our job is we're, we're, we're mental athletes and we make a living by talking to people. So it's very important and impactful for us to listen to our own calls. Very important and impactful to listen to our um, loan officers' calls and get better at the craft. I know for myself, I'll listen to, uh, after I do a presentation, a lot of times I will get my presentations transcribed and I'll go through there and I'll count the amount of ums I say because I know that's something that does not sound great in a presentation and I know this is a craft that I have to get better at. We all have to look at what we're doing and try to incrementally get better and listen to the calls again because that's the job we're doing. All this other stuff, who we call, when we call, why we call, that is definitely important. And that is definitely something you need to put in process. But when you're, you know, again, the analogy of playing basketball, at the end of the day, when you're on the court shooting, that's the job you're doing. You should be reviewing that. And if you're not listening to your own sales calls, if you're not listening to your team sales calls, you don't know what's really going on on your sales floor. You don't understand why your conversions are what they are, if they're high or they're low, because you don't understand what your loan officers are saying on the phone. So really, really impactful and important, review sales calls. The other thing about reviewing sales calls, I've seen this time and time again. <clears throat> I remember when I was the first I was a loan officer at IndyMac Bank, they came out and said, we're going to start doing reviewing sales calls. We're going to review 15% of everyone's sales calls. Conversions went up across the floor. And I was kind of like, wow, why did conversions go up? I, I didn't get it. And what I realized was, is they gave people a sales process. When you answer the phone, we want you to say this in the first three minutes. This is the process we want you to take. And they gave everyone a mirror and say, look at the mirror and see if you're smiling. Because if you're smiling when you're on the phone, you have energy. And what we found was, you take a call, you're talking to someone, even if you didn't think this was a deal, a lot of times loan officers will prejudge and decide this isn't a deal. They would at least pretend like it, they were doing their job. They were going to be energetic. They're going to say what they needed to say because that's what they're going to be held accountable towards. And lo and behold, guess what? It worked. Like every call, they got more energetic on. Every call, they went ahead and went through the sales process and all their numbers went up. And then it was just, it reinforced the idea that this is a process. This is how you do it. Get really good at the job. So I can tell you guys right now, if you're out there, if you're not listening to sales calls, if you implement a process where you are routinely listening to sales calls and routinely giving feedback, you will get an increase in conversion. There's just no two ways about it. And again, Dale, I really liked, uh, you know, the, the, the energy part of being out on the floor and really how, how do you drive that. And sales calls is a great way to see how the energy comes across the, uh, come, comes across the phone. Uh, you know, it, it's amazing what you can learn when you listen to um, a call with a loan officer and then sit down with them and go through it with them one-on-one. -on -one. It really does make a difference. Um, and, and it leads right into the, the, the final point I want to make today, and it's coach right behaviors. Vince Lombardi, my, one of my favorite examples of leadership, um, said this, success demands singleness of purpose. And he goes on to say that the achievements of an organization are the combined effort of each individual. And, and what he's saying there is, first off, every person counts within your organization. Every person serves a very important purpose. Um, from the CEO right on down to the, the person um, at the front reception desk and everybody in between. Well, we've been focusing predominantly on sales uh, forces within this, um, this context. And your sales team obviously is a critical aspect of your success because um, if you're not selling, there's nothing to process, there's nothing to underwrite, there's nothing to fund, and there's nothing to close, and there's no profitability. Um, and, and that means that because you need to have a sales centered organization, you need to make sure that your sales are done effectively. I mean, this is what I've built a career around is 
sales training that that is is based on best practices to really teach loan officers how to really have strategies and techniques to to be very successful and and that's what you need to do as a manager is you need to be a great coach um, it, it's it's one thing to manage I've always said there's there's three different kinds of people in the management sector there's leaders there's managers there's coaches if we're really working great we're all three of those leaders are people who have vision there there's ones who have charisma they're the ones who people follow that's a great trait there's managers who just manage activities and by nature of the term management that's what you do you manage activities and manage processes and then there's coaches and 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 those those are the folks that are really digging in sitting down on a face-to-face -face level day-to-day -day level working with people on improving their skills great sales managers have all three of these skills put together and that's what i've always tried to teach is how do you combine those three um, john maxwell said this he said great leaders know the way show the way and go the way and i love that quote um, they know the way they, they they know what it takes to succeed they go the way um, they, they walk in that and then they show the way they teach other people how to do it that's that replication process that i talked about a little while ago so when we talk about coaching right habits, you can't coach right habits and behaviors if you don't know what the current habit or behavior is. This is why having access to recorded calls and listening to your salespeople and also doing it on the live sales floor um, and, and, and making sure that you are um, really keen in on listening to every aspect of that call from you know, how is their tone to how is their strategies? How is their approach? Were they prepared? How do they respond to, you know, key parts of the call, like the initial rate question, like objections? You know, are they building relationship? Um, you know, are they asking the right questions? Are they order taking? Are they truly relationship building? I mean, there's an, a whole lot you can glean from listening to these calls. And then the key is, as you listen to them with your salesperson, you stop at optimum times where um, where you've seen a change in the course of the call or, or they did something you want to correct. And, and what I've found is, is, is there's a real key here when you do this, and it's to focus on both errors and excellence. I kind of alluded to this earlier. We tend to sometimes listen to recordings or coach people. What we do is we tell them everything they do wrong. We tell them how to do it right, and then we walk away and wonder why nothing changes. Well, I, I believe you want to try the opposite. Start with what they do right. Tell them all the things they're doing right and 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 then help them with things they do wrong. What I've found is when somebody makes a mistake, you don't have to tell them they made a mistake. They'll usually know that on their own. All you got to do is stop the tape and go, tell me about that right there. What happened? Because I noticed that the, the customer's voice tone changed. It sounded like that kind of the call started going the wrong direction. They'll usually be more critical on themselves than you could ever be on them. And what that allows you to do is to actually encourage them through that, coach them through that and give them right direction on how to move forward and do it differently. It also allows you to learn great techniques that salespeople are using that you can apply to your other sales force and your other salespeople. So you're not only, um, when you're coaching, spending time with your salespeople to identify mistakes and correct those, and you wanna do it in a way that doesn't make them feel bad. We call it the sandwich principle, where you basically start with the thing they've done well, go into the thing they need to correct, and then end with how when they add that to the other things they're doing well, they're gonna be spectacular. So you're ending on a good note, you're starting on a good note, and, and in the middle is where you're doing the corrective action. This kind of coaching with a positive mindset, positive attitude, uh, you know, a sincere approach where you really wanna help them get better, is gonna make them successful. Look, when I started my career as a manager, I was a hard driving manager and I wasn't a nice guy to work for a lot of times and I'll be the first to admit it. And I learned over my careers as I got older and hopefully a little bit wiser that, you know, it's the old saying, you can attract a, a lot more bees with honey than you do with vinegar. Well, I'm gonna change and convert a lot more of my salespeople or my ops people if I'm an ops manager or whatever people I'm managing, by helping them and coaching them into the right behaviors, the right strategies and the right techniques. And the best way to do that is by utilizing best practices of your top producers and replicating those things within your sales force. And, and, and when you do that, you really see great results. And, and when you coach them versus just tell them 
what happens is they get buy into it because you're getting them involved in the process of learning. It's just a very powerful way to, to really train people well, get them to the next level and, and, and get them to where they want to be. Um, it, it really comes down to, to this one simple point. And the point is this, if we keep our people focused on the right behaviors, then we're going to see the right results. It's just that simple. Any thoughts on that, Josh? I think, Dale, I think the, 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 the line, if we keep our people focused on the right behaviors, we'll see the right results. I think that really does sum it up really well. Uh, <clears throat> and, you know, as you're listening and you're trying to figure out what's the best things I can take, what can I take from this, you know, there's a handful of things. I think one of the overarching things, Dale, and I'm glad that you really honed in on it, is just in this process, when we have data and information and we have the ability to really manage someone's actions and ability, it's great to have that data and it's very powerful, but that data is to be used and you use that to coach people. Right, Dale? That, that at the end of the day, our jobs are should, is to coach our, our staff. How do we help them be the best they can be? It's not telling them they're not doing the job. It's going in and saying, how do I help you? I, I was an uh, athlete, I played college football, and I had you know, coaches, and I had a coach that had just gotten done playing for the Raiders, and so when he was helping us and he was coaching us or doing something, I had one coach who would basically say, you didn't move him off the line far enough, Josh. You, gotta get, you need to get him run the line. The other one would come in and say, let me show you how to actually do it. And that was the coach everyone followed. So listen, coach your people, understand your stats, right? Just kind of leave it, kind of, kind of put it down. Know, know what works, have a process so you can have alerts in the right place. Manage to the process, and then you review your customer experience and you, and you inspect what you expect. So if you put something in place, you coach your, your, your staff, and then you review it with your staff, you're going to get the results you want. And that's at the end of the day, that's what we're all trying to do is, you know, really be professionals in how do we lift production. I don't know if we have any time for questions. Um, if we do have some questions, Jamie, I'll let you go ahead and uh, we can try a few questions before we run out of time here. Okay, thank you. Yes, um, if you have any questions, drop them into the question box. Um, we do have one question. What are some practical ways to motivate your team other than praise? Dale, you want to take a shot at that one? Other than what, Jamie? Can the you repeat question that question? Is what are, yes, what are some practical ways to motivate your team other than praise? Um, so what I found is one of the most powerful motivators is uh, peer pressure motivation. Now, now that sounds negative. Let me, let me clarify this because it's got to come from a positive bent. So, for example, one of the things that I always had was a daily sales goal board, basically showed, you know, how people were doing on a daily basis. Um, and, and, and I would use that as an encouraging tool to motivate my people. Anything that you do that can create a comparison between your employees on how they're doing, particularly in the sales environment, to create some competition is very powerful. Incentives and contests are huge. Um, anything that you can do that, that can incent people, I find that many times people will work far harder for something small and simple that almost costs nothing than they will for um, you know, big accolades or, or big dollar rewards. So it's really just making sure that you are doing those things that keep your people motivated by encouraging, by creating you know, incentives, by building competition, because peer pressure can be very powerful. These kinds of things add a lot of value. I agree with that, Dale. Um, having that, that peer pressure and what we've done in our platform is <clears throat> the sell stats everyone can see. So loan officers typically, you don't want to be at the bottom of the board. No one wants to be at the bottom. Right? Everyone wants to be, we're competitive. And you're right, the sales contest, when I was a loan officer, I remember my sales manager said, Josh, if I just have a contest for like a six pack of Diet Coke, I'll get you to work harder than you ever worked that day. At the end of the day, it wasn't about the money a lot of times for competitive people. It's about trying to win and trying to compete. And I think that is a really good way to, to, to drive motivation. It's people like to get, and it's fun. It's fun to compete. It's fun to have contests. So it's definitely, you know, that's, that's some good advice. Jamie, any other questions or are we out of time? Um, we are just about out of time. Uh, but if anyone has any other questions, you, uh, we have the contact information right up here and you can reach out to Josh or Dale. Um, and the recording will be going out shortly after. So thank you everyone for your time and be sure to register for next week's um, boot camp session. I'll be sure to include a link in our follow-up email. Thanks.
Thank you, everybody. Thanks, guys.